Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, officers, for the refresher course. We are so much happy to increase our knowledge in terms of looking after um, children and corporate parenting committee meeting. Now, we will start by introducing ourselves. And um, I will start um, the introduction from the members of the board. And I'm going to start from Cancelo Sarah Marjoni. If you can introduce yourself, please. Hello, I'm Councillor Sarah Mulgowney. I'm Councillor Adam Carter. Evening, I'm Councillor Jenny Smith. I'm Councillor Karen Raper. Good evening, I'm Councillor Jane Pothicary. Good evening, I'm Maureen Pierce, Councillor Maureen Pierce. Good evening, everybody. I'm Councillor Georgette Polly. I'm now going to ask our guests and officers to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Chair of the Children Care Council and I'm Christopher Bennett. Hi, my name's Anna Gidotti and I work with the Children and Care Council. Hello, I'm Sharon Smith. I'm chair of the Thorough One Team Foster Care Association. Thank you. <laughs> so sorry, <laughs> this is my first time. I am Councillor Abi Akinbon and I'm the chair of this committee. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting is being live streamed to the council website. I would also like to remind members and officers to use their microphone when speaking. Item one, apologies for absence. Yes, Chair, we've had apologies from Councillor Little and Councillor Maureen Pierce is substituting for her. We've also got an officer on the MST, Mandy Moore. Is there any Good evening, everyone. Is there any more apologies? I didn't know when to come in. Um, I'm Mandy Moore. I'm the um, strategic lead for business intelligence. I support children's services. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Hi, Mandy. It's your turn to, re um, to introduce your report. Can you hear us now? 
I can, yes, come back at the right time. Thank you very much, Wendy. Thank you, everybody. Um, the report was sent round um, with the papers. Um, it provides information on the performance across children looked after and aftercare. The overall performance for the service is good, and this is within the context of COVID-19 and the lockdown restrictions, which have been in place over the period of April 20 to March 21. This report covers data up to quarter four of the 2020-21 reporting year, so that's January to March 21. I'll go through and tease out a few um, of the key areas um, to talk through with you. So in section three, which actually looks at the performance data for children looked after, you'll note in section 3.1 that we have 301 children looked after as at the end of March 21. The numbers have remained stable and the small fluctuations are normal and to be expected in this regard. In section 3.2, you'll see that relates to unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. These are a subset of the numbers of children looked after, the 301 above. In the last quarter, between January and March, we had nine new arrivals in Surrey, which has shown an increased number of American children in our children looked after cohort to 20. This does, however, remain below Thurrock ceiling of 31 children. Each authority ceiling for UASC is 0.07% and it's based on an analysis of the total child population within the borough. Moving on to section 3.3, this therefore uh, equates the number of our children into a rate so that it can be ben benchmarked against other uh, comparator groups such as statistical neighbours and eastern region. So, but 301, this equates to a rate of 67 per 10,000 of the population. And you'll see there from the chart that's included that this is in line with the statistical neighbour and regional average of 67. In 3.4, this details the children looked after episodes that started in month. The data shows that there has been a decrease in the number of children entering care since the start of the pandemic. For example, looking on a quarterly basis, 36 children started to be looked after between January and March 2021. This is compared to 83 who started in the same period last year. All cases, of course, are reviewed to ensure the correct children come into care and the court proceedings are only issued where necessary. Within section 3.5, there's also details of the number of children looked after episodes that ended in month. It has been a decrease in the number of children leaving care, as well as entering since the start of the pandemic. Between April 2020 and March 2021, there was 146 children ceased to be looked after, compared to our statistical neighbour of 159 between 19 and 20, which is the latest published stats that we can benchmark ourselves against. A total of 33 were ceased during quarter one, January to March 21. The decrease is partly due to a delay in the timeliness of court proceedings, which is preventing children from leaving care and progressing to their permanent placement, adoption, SGO or returning home. There's some tables that have been provided that breaks down by gender, ethnicity, age profile and category of need for your information in the report. I'll move on to section four around the number of children looked after open to youth offending service. So in section 4.1, this is around statutory interventions. A statutory intervention is when a child has been convicted by the courts or made subject to a youth caution or youth conditional caution and consequently has a youth offending service intervention. During 2020-21, there were 46 children open to the youth offending service on statutory outcomes, out of which nine were children looked after. Out of the nine children looked after, 56% of those were from a black, Asian and minority ethnic community. The throughput of the youth offending service during 2020-21 has been significantly affected by COVID-19 and the closure of the courts. This has resulted in delays of children being sentenced and lower numbers of young people being referred to the youth offending service for statutory intervention. 
In 4.2, this covers the youth detention accommodation. Under the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act 2012, any child that is made subject to a youth detention accommodation order or remand in custody by the courts automatically becomes looked after by the local authority. You'll see from the chart there that there has been a significant increase in youth detention accommodation orders in 2021, with six children gaining child looked after status through the criminal courts. Of the six children made subject to the youth detention accommodation order during that year, five, 83%, were from a Bain community. This is reflective of overrepresentation of children from the com that community in the criminal justice system and in particular the figures in relation to children in custody locally and nationally. In section 4.3, this covers out-of-court disposal panel. During 2020-21, the out-of-court disposal panel dealt with 43 offences relating to 33 children, of which five children had looked after status. All five were diverted away from the criminal justice system, which identified support from the Youth Offended, Offending Service Partnership. The Thurrock Youth Offending Service and Essex Police, Police are committed to the national protocol aimed to reduce the criminalisation of children looked after. And there is a link to that protocol that was sent round with papers, should you wish to refer to that. In section five, this covers the children looked after missing episodes that started. It is of note that the number of missing episodes has decreased, although the number of children those episodes relate to has risen slightly for the quarter. There is a weekly missing meeting with partners that includes Essex Police and liaison with Thurrock Community Safety Colleagues. In section 5.1, this covers the child looked after return to home interview. So since the 1st of April 2020, Inspire Youth Hub have been commissioned to undertake independent return home interviews. All children are offered a return home interview within 72 hours following each missing event with the aim of understanding the young person's circumstances and the reason why they go missing. You'll see from the table that has been included there that Inspire Youth Hub are managing to increase the numbers of young people who are engaged with their service and this does continue to be monitored within the service on a regular basis. Within section 5.2, this relates to the timeliness of social worker visits. So social workers are required to visit the child within one week of the start of any placement. Visits are then due in accordance to the time agreed within the care plan, and that can vary from 20 to 65 working days. We achieved 97% during the month of March, which is very good performance, as there are often practical reasons for visits being late and there are safeguards to ensure that missed visits take place quickly after the due date. The performance has much improved during the last reporting year. This time last year, we were at 78.7%. In section 5.3, the children looked after initial health assessment. Every child who becomes looked after should have an initial health assessment within 20 days of entering into care. Sometimes notifications for the IHA cannot be processed if parents have not provided consent for medical treatment and there is no court order which gives the local authority responsibility for consenting to the health care. There is a weekly IHA tracking meeting that ensures there is a focus on meeting the five day target to notify health that a child has been looked after and ensure that an initial health assessment is offered and completed within 20 working days. The chart below shows the performance, which is variable, but does evidence that it is an improving picture. Below that, the chart reflects the timeliness of the IHA appointments actually being completed within the 20 working days during the period April 20 to March 21. Um, it is of note that in some circumstances, an IHA appointment was offered by health within the 20 working days. However, there are occasions when the initial appointment offered is not taken up, so that can cause a delay. In section six, this talks of number of children adopted. So between 1st of April 2020 and 31st of March 21, a total of eight children were adopted six children are placed in adoptive placements and have adoption hearings planned. There are a further 11 children with a care plan for adoption and they are awaiting a court decision. 
this is another area where due to COVID there have been significant delays in court proceeding. It is therefore expected that there will be an increased number of children adopted throughout the 2020 to 2022, sorry, 2021 to 22 period with increased court hearings as the pandemic eases. Section 6.1 refers to timeliness of adoption. This measure is the average length of time from the child entering care to moving in with an adoptive family and the performance is currently good at 341 days. You'll see that the latest benchmarks in the chart for our statistical neighbours is 350 and for England it's 376. The measure has now been adjusted from a statutory indicator perspective to include foster carers who adopt children that are placed with them. The average time for a child entering care and being placed with their adoptive family, including those foster carers who adopt children, is 266 days for adoptions completed. It's a three year average across 2018 to 2021. We'll be able to look at benchmarking once the um, figures are published for those new indicators moving forward. The measure in the timeliness of finding a family for a child once Thurrock has received authority from the call, the average time in days between Thurrock receiving this was 186 days to when the child was placed with an adopted family. This is an area for the service to focus on as the impact of COVID will affect the timeliness of children being placed for adoption. This is obviously starting to be seen within the figures of 186, which is slightly above the previous stat neighbour and regional benchmarking, but more recent figures have not yet been published for other local authorities, so we're unable to gauge the impact on them as they are likely in a similar situation. Section 7 relates to the care leaving service. Uh, you'll see the graph in there shows the total number of young people aged 16 to 25 who are in receipt of the care leaving service. The numbers are increasing and this is in part due to the legislative changes that place additional responsibilities upon the care leaving services under the Children and Social Work Act 2017. But by section 3 of the Act now requires local authorities to appoint a personal advisor for care leavers who request one up until the age of 25. So you can see there, as at the end of March, we was at 286. We've got some breakdown charts by age and gender for your review. In section 7.1, this covers care leavers aged between 19 and 21 years who are in education, employment or training. In March 2021, 41% of the care leavers between those ages were part work in part or full-time education, employment or training compared to 69% at the same time last year. The decrease in performance can be singularly attributed to COVID. To strengthen the oversight and planning to ensure our young people have support and opportunities for education employment and training, there are two monthly panels which focus on pre and post 18 year olds who do not have an EAT offer. The panel discussions have highlighted the impact of COVID-19 on young people who have which has limited opportunities to engage in work experience and continue with employment. Section 7.2 relates to care leavers aged 19 to 21 in suitable accommodation. In March 2021, the number of 19 to 21 year olds reported to be in suitable accommodation was 87%. This remains slightly higher than the statistical neighbour average of 86 and the England average of 85. Sorry, my computer's just. In 7.3, this relates to the care leavers aged 19 to 21 years in touch. Local authorities are expected to stay in touch with care leavers and provide statutory support to help the care leaver transition to living independently. Thurrock was in touch with 94% of care leavers in March 21. This is a uh, positive performance and above both the statistical neighbour average of 89 and England, England average of 90%. In section 8, this covers the children looked after fostering. In March 2021, there were 89 Thurrock approved fostering households, providing 119 children with a foster family. 
In 8.1, this covers the uh, recruitment over the period of 2019 to 21. Um, it has been successful, 2019-20, um, 19 newly registered, um, and 11 in 2021. There is detail in the report of those that are no longer registered, and you'll see of the 14 that, that have left the fostering during 2021, there's a breakdown there of the reasons as to why that decision was taken. It is of note that no thorough foster care has resigned from thorough in order to transfer to another fostering agency. That completes the highlights from the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do members have any questions or comment um, about this report? Thank you, Chair. Um, if we can go back to 3.4 on page 14. So, obviously, the number of children entering care and the number of children leaving care are both down. Um, I just wondered, what do we think the reasons for that? Is it totally due to COVID? And um, if people aren't, if children aren't coming forward that we might expect to come forward, um, does that mean we're missing children? Um, and what 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 um, things are in place to make sure that we're not missing children who need our help? Thank you. So yeah, I think it is fair to say that the numbers have gone down. What we know is that last year, so in 2019 to 2020, we had quite a significant number of UASC um, that were accommodated in that year, which would have impacted, so well over 100. Um, whereas this year, we seem to have had a very, uh, quite a decreased number, especially during the COVID outbreak. Um, we, we had a significant number of children that came into care in February last year, and we had two really large sibling groups, I think one of seven and one of, we have three large sibling groups, really, actually, one of seven and, one of, and two of five, I think. So things like that can really impact on the figures and kind of seeing the numbers go up and down. What we do know is that the numbers of children that we have in care, that hasn't gone down. So what we're seeing is that children are sometimes staying in care a bit longer, some of that because of the impact of COVID, and some of that because it's the right children at the right time. So what you will sort of see some fluctuation in terms of children coming in and children going out. It doesn't remain static each year. Um, but what should remain fairly static is the amount of children we have in care. Um, so what we do, we have um, a placement panel, which is held weekly to discuss any children that are coming into care to make sure it's the right children at the right time. Wherever possible, one of the things we're doing is working with families so I think, you know, we, we're trying to kind of keep children within their family network. And sometimes that means that they don't have to become looked after, but we look at alternative orders within the court or family arrangements. So sometimes that will be the reason. Um, we have legal planning meetings to make sure that we're considering thresholds for children. We have thresholds within our MASH, so when children come in through the front door, to make sure that we're measuring them against a clear threshold. So there's a number of checks and balances in place. For children who are in care, we also have our permanency tracking meetings that are held weekly as well to make sure that we're really on top of the care plans, that children aren't just in care and drifting. And we also have what we call a PLO tracker, which is pre-proceedings, so where children might be coming into care to make sure that we're tracking that and making sure it's the right decision at the right time. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, so uh, I'm glad to hear about the sort of pre-care tracker meetings so does that mean if if children for example as you were saying earlier when they come into care it's normally through a court court proceedings so given that the judicial system has been heavily impact, impacted from covid does that mean you're still able to keep a track on um children that maybe would have been brought into care but haven't been able to because of covid so if a child needs to come into care then something like COVID, if we knew that there was a child out there, we had a referral which said there's a child that's at risk who needs to be in care. So first of all, we'd have conversations with parents if we thought it was, we could manage that under what we call section 20, which is a voluntary arrangement. 
Secondly, if we thought, actually, it's not safe for the child to be at home and we need to act now, and we, the parents won't agree to it. So this year we've probably had what we call more emergency protection orders than we would have in previous years. So if we think that there's no way around it, then we will sometimes utilise the courts and ask for an emergency protection order. The police are able to take what they call police protection, which will last for 72 hours to allow us to get into court. So we are kind of, there are different ways to manage that. So I would say that wherever we identify that a child needs to be in care, then they are brought into care. Thank you, that's very reassuring. I just wanted to add to what Janet said is, the issue about COVID and the courts is not about us getting into court, it's then how long the hearings take. So if a child, if we feel a child is in is at risk or in danger, we can still apply to the courts and we will get, if the court agree, the orders. What's taking longer is to have the hearings. So whereas they're meant to sort of take place within six months, they are taking a lot longer now to for some children for us to get there. So COVID itself doesn't prevent us going into court. What it means is it's taking longer than it used to to get the hearings completed. But the children are in our care under orders during that period of time. Thank you. Thank you for that, Claire. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor. Um, can I just ask something about 7.1? Uh, there's a significant drop in the number of children in education, employment or training, which I presume is linked almost exclusively to uh, the COVID problems we've had. Are there any specific strategies being adopted to address that rapidly? That is directly as a result of COVID and it has impacted particularly the 18 to 21 year old cohort. Um, it is very challenging to get work experience or to get um, some of the work, some of the work that our young people was doing was part time work and flexible working and in, in um, restaurant businesses, etc. So there we're hoping that that will start to improve and we have got um a program where we're supporting them we've tried to keep the inspire um youth hub open for face to face so as soon as we could open that we did open that and our education and skills colleagues are in there um with appointments face to face to help young people with their cvs and to um, go through help for interviews etc we are looking at um how we have a bespoke panel so we look at what the young people are interested in and then we try and match them to interests or work experience or employment that matches with that um but it's the availability of that work um, it is an area that we we are uh, absolutely acutely aware of and the impact on our young people as well um, has been significant. It, they have been supported with the additional government benefits that they've received as well. So we're hoping, um, working towards a September offer for young people um, to try and get them back into college and, and also to be doing that work experience and employment and part-time employment as well so uh, they have the on track therapy program which offers um, access to employment and training we have the panel where we review those who are um, with our education and employment and we also have the princess trust and some other more bespoke programs from our education and skills colleagues thank you Um, so just on that question as well, we're making full use of the um, government programme called Kickstart and um, getting young people onto that for six months. And in fact, today I, I do a monthly meet and greet new, new staff and it, we had four young people from Kickstart and one is a care leaver to this authority. So that's really, really exciting. You know, hope it lasts longer than six months. Councillor. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. 
Um, I just wanted to go to section 8.1, and I know we're going to talk about um, a recruit, foster care recruitment in detail in a later report, but I just wanted to double check that I've understood this table correctly, because every time I look at it, I think that either the numbers are wrong, I haven't understood the table, or my maths is very, very bad, all of which could have happened. Um, it says that over the period 2019 to 2021, recruitment activity has been successful, so that's a two-year period. Yet by my maths on these figures, that would mean that in a two-year period, we've had a net gain of one fostering household, which feels, uh, uh, m by my definition, wouldn't be successful. So I'm just wondering if we could have a little bit of context around those numbers, because that feels like we're not going in the right direction if, if over two years we've only gained one fostering household. I think that... Um to, 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 to continue having the same amount or even a small increase in fostering households is a success. Um, it is very challenging to recruit foster carers. And so in different local authorities, um, if you were doing what Thurrock is achieving, it is successful because you're not decreasing the volume of foster carers and um, available fostering households. So I know you probably want us to be more ambitious and to be, um, and we would like to obviously increase in the paper that comes later, we're saying we want to increase by 20 fostering households. That is a very, very ambitious target. Um, and we have a very uh, aggressive marketing plan in order to achieve the recruitment of 20 fostering households and I, I think in the plan it's outlined how many um, inquiries you need to have to convert into one fostering household and it's it's really it's that hard um, so yes although one an increase of one may not seem like we're um, significantly over recruiting we're doing very well in the current climate to be able to be breaking even um, and other local authorities are, are um, would be envious of Thurrock's position. Can I just follow up on that, Chair? I can go for it. Um, okay, so what would have been really useful would have just been that little bit of context in that bit. Sort of the rest of the report has a lot of kind of context with the statistical neighbour and the sort of um, the England national average. So it'd be really useful if we could see some kind of contextual data. Because for us, I, I can only take your word for it. Um, that, that, that it's successful, if that makes sense, when it doesn't look massive, <laughs> it doesn't look massively impressive how it's been laid out. So it'd be really helpful to have that little bit of context for us. Um, and then I just wanted to follow up on your point about the 20 additional fostering households. Is that net or is that just additional um, households? It's net. Okay, so that that, that is actually does actually sound very, very ambitious then compared to these figures. Okay, it will be lovely if we can achieve that. Thank you. Is it okay if I just come in quickly? I can see um, somebody's got their hand up over there, but I just wanted to kind of say, it is not just about the amount of foster carers, but it's about the amount of placements. So technically, depending on how many children they can take, then that also can kind of impact on the, the, the success when I look at the numbers of the children that are in foster care in-house, that number has increased. So I think we're utilising our foster carers in a, in a much more positive way in terms of the amount of children that are with our in-house foster carers. So it's also about, so you could have 200 foster carers in Thurrock. If you're not utilising them and if children are not in those placements, then it's not a success. So I think what we can see at the moment is that we've got quite a lot of success with our foster carers taking children. Throughout the pandemic, that's been uh, a particular positive. And I think perhaps if we hadn't been, um, if, the, if we hadn't had COVID over the last year, we'd have probably seen a much more of a success in terms of our recruitment. And we're doing quite a lot of work with our foster carers who are supporting us with our recruitment strategy, um, kind of uh, trying to support each other and make sure that foster carers get what they need. We've also um, done some work around things like council tax exemptions for foster carers. 
sort of trying to do work around foster carers who are with agencies who've got our children when we're looking at matching, having those conversations about conversions and whether or not foster carers will come across the thorax. So we're trying to think of different ways to manage that really and to be ambitious. I think it is ambitious, 20, but I think that's absolutely right. And I think in the last three years as well, and I think, I don't know if our fostering colleagues would agree, but what we've done is we've set some really clear standards in terms of what we want from our foster carers to get the best care for our children. And that's meant that we've, sometimes we've lost foster carers because of that, but I think that's been the right decision. Um, through Some of them through standards of care, and some of them because people think, actually, I don't want to work in the way you want. But we're really clear that we're ambitious for our children and we want the best foster carers. We think we've now managed to sort of probably stabilise that bit. And so hopefully as we go forward, we will lose less foster carers and gain more. That would be really positive and i was just just gonna say that that point about placements is really interesting and the number and again if, if we could get a little bit more detail on that so we can make sort of a bit more kind of sense of the numbers that we're being given that would be really helpful thank you yeah i was also just going to add to that that you know we've had five households retire and two who've resigned for, and quite a lot of that I think has also been due to COVID. Some of our foster carers who some of them have had to self-isolate for a whole length of time and in the end they decided not to carry on fostering. So I think we would have looked more even in the numbers if it hadn't been under COVID because I don't think some of those would have retired if it hadn't been for the COVID situation. So I think that would have helped it. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just interested in statistical neighbour. Uh, Thorough has always been quite unique in its demographic. We are one side we're bordered by Essex, and the other side we're bordered by local, um, sorry, London boroughs of. And there has been suggestions in the past that the London boroughs were given better incentives for their foster carers, and I think some of that was mentioned in the agencies. So I'm very pleased to hear the work that we're doing to try and uh, give our foster carers a better deal and acknowledge the great work that they do and, and try and help them sort of work with Thurrock Council. Um, just, just wondered who our statistical neighbour, who we're comparing ourselves with and if it's a, a good um, representation, a good yardstick really to see if we're, we're doing, if we're comparing pears with pears and apples with apples, I think is what I'm trying to say. Um, and also uh, numbers are challenging and, and I agree with my colleague that a little bit more detail on on why these households, that was interesting to know that some of it is from COVID, others might have been um, for other reasons. Uh, and it's good that we're, we're doing the overview and scrutiny with the households and, and, and saying if, if, if those foster homes are, are not working with us, then, then maybe we need to revisit it and not being frightened to say that, uh, you know, if it, it's not a case of just taking anyone for fostering. But the statistical neighbour, I'd be interested to know who that is. Thank you. So in terms of um, our statistical neighbours, we've got quite a wide range, really. So, And what we know is that our statistical neighbours, they don't all perform the same. So we've got Medway, Bexley, Bromley, um, Swindon, Sheffield, Telford. Um, more recently, and I think it's... it's Peterborough. Um, so there's a, a number of local authorities, but they don't all perform the same as us um, in terms of their looked after numbers and things like that. But when it comes to foster carers and how much we pay our foster carers, what support we put into our foster carers, how we've decided on um, how much, uh, how we support them financially, we compared ourselves against other local authorities that are bordering on Thurrock rather than our statistical neighbours because if we're going to lose foster carers, that's who we're going to lose them to. We're not going to lose them to our statistical neighbours. So we looked at Essex, Havering, 
um, Barking and Dagenham, um, South End, all the kind of authorities that kind of border on us. We looked at how much they were paying their foster carers, what supports they put in, and we we reviewed what we were kind of what support we were offering to our foster carers and thought, well, we want to make our offer competitive and make sure that our foster carers are being rewarded for the work they do. They work really hard. We've got some really good foster carers. And I'd say that over the last two years, you know, two, three years, there's been a lot of hard work put into that bit of the service to make sure we have the right people. And I feel that we do have the right people now. Um, and some of that's been, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's not always an easy road, but we, I think we are in the right position now. So it's about how do we build on that? How do we develop that? And so we've offered something unique in Thurrock to our, our, our bordering authorities. We've offered a council tax um, incentive, you know, to sort of say, look, if you're a foster carer for Thurrock, you won't pay council tax. Um, and that's a really big incentive. And so we, what we did in terms of doing that piece of work, we looked at what other local authorities had achieved through a council tax incentive. And so there are a number of local authorities who did that, but we were lucky that none of them were necessarily right on our border. <coughs> um, and we were able to see the, the benefits that local authorities achieve, had achieved through that. And you know, foster carers are not gonna become foster carers because we give them a council tax, incent tax incentive. But what we might do is get some of those foster carers who are maybe just over the road, we might be able to get them to kind of come into our camp, some of those good foster carers. And we've kind of tried to and retain them, but also those foster carers who've already got our children that aren't necessarily working for Thurrock. And so what, and to kind of, I think, I think it was you said about kind of, in terms of agency foster carers, it may cost more for an agency foster carers, but agency foster carers do not get paid more than our foster carers. It just costs us more because obviously there's on costs for that agency. Okay. Thank you very much, officers. Okay, Cancela. Councillor Smith. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on 5.4, the education. Um, it's fabulous to see that we're in the top 25%, um, and I just hope that continues. So well done to everyone who's involved in that. I don't know if that's Keeley. And also, can I just ask a silly question? 3.5. What does the acronym SGO stand for? So that stands for Special Guardianship Order. Right. Um, and it's an order that's used usually when children are placed um, with sometimes with family or friends. It could be an aunt, an uncle, um, a cousin, and sometimes foster carers who decide that they want to offer a young person permanency outside of the fostering system. Cancel. Oh, aren't you good for us? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I just want to go back to page 17 and um, looked after children by category of need. Um, I was just looking at the increase in 2021 of those children that are coming into care. Um, it's about a 10% increase because of abuse or neglect and wondered what you thought the underlying factors are for that change. And just quickly, the other point was um, under 4.2 about the over-representation of children um, in youth detention um, from the Bain community. Um, so in terms of, you said the children looked after where the primary need is abuse or neglect and that that number was increasing. So there's a slight increase of 1% from, if you look at, it's kind of gone up and down. So in, in March 19, it was 62%. It went up to 71 in 20, 72 in, 20, in March 21. Um, right. So yes, it's, it's, it's gone up. What we know is that we've, I think in terms of children um, who are coming into our care system, we can see it across also our children that, that are on a plan as well. And so in terms of children coming into our care, that can fluctuate, it can go up and down. There may not be a particular reason why that's happening. 
and it could be in, in terms of our statistical neighbours, um, we're kind of, this, that they're, last year they were at 68%, we were slightly over. So there doesn't seem to be, I don't think it means that there's anything different going on. Sometimes it's about how people categorise the category of need as well. So sometimes there could be more than one factor. So if the, the overriding factor is abuse or neglect, we know that neglect is usually one of the biggest ones. Um, so I don't know that there's any one reason that I could say, well, it's this or it's that. It's, I don't think it's because of COVID. I don't think it's because anything different is, ha different is happening. But what we do know is that we've had reported a more complex need, set of needs coming into the system in the last year. And I think, sorry, just to kind of finish, I think when you've got a situation like COVID, what you do have is we know that there's been more instances of domestic violence. Um, we know that people have been suffering with their mental health. And so that could have an impact on how people are feeling and how they're managing their children. Yeah, sorry, just to be clear, the 10% the increase was over the two-year period from, I think it was 62%, is that right, in 2000, March 2019? Mm -hmm. And now 72% in March mm. 2021. It was just that yeah. that increase. I understand that there was the biggest jump was between 2019 and 2020. Yeah. And I know that, like I said, last year, this time, so there was a period between... I would say the end of the last year, beginning of the 2020, so we could probably see quite a big jump because, as I said, there was a number, a significant number of large families that came into Thurrock that weren't necessarily from Thurrock where neglect was a significant issue. So children who'd been on and off plans in other local authorities. And for these numbers, because of the numbers that are looked after, you only need a, a difference of about 20 children and it, it significantly increases where you're coming in in terms of neglect and physical abuse. But we know that we had a number of children come into our authorities that where neglect was an issue, which is why we had a large number of children come into our care in February last year. Right, thanks, that's, that's reassuring. It just seemed like quite a big, quite a big jump and I just wondered what, what the uh, underlying reason for that may be. Um, so thank you for that. And the other um, figures were about um, the over-representation of children from the Bain community in the criminal justice system. I'll pick that one up. Page 19, I think. Um, so this is a national issue um, and it all it all sort of stems back to to the police and and the amount of stop and searches that they do with young black males. Um, they are overrepresented in stop stop and search. They are also overrepresented in um, in arrests. This has led to um, the numbers of BAME children of BAME children being given the opportunity to be diverted from the criminal justice system. So what that means is that you will have a a young black male that may have been found in possession of cannabis, first offence. Um, that would usually go to the out-of-court disposal panel, which deals with the lower level um, crimes, and they are then given the opportunity to be diverted by providing interventions to those young people early on in their, in their sort of criminal behaviour. What we have found by doing some, some work, and it is, it's not just a thorough issue, as I've said, it is a national issue, is that young people from the BAME community are not being given that opportunity to be offered that diversion work. So subsequently you end up with more young black males in the court system, hence more remand into custody and therefore more sentenced into, into custody. Great, thank you. And this is part, part of the protocol for... Uh, not only our looked after children, but the BAME community to actually Absolutely. give them diversion. Yes. Just um, a quick note, because I did try and look at the, the link at the bottom um, for the protocol. Um, it's actually missing out unnecessary. It should be on reducing unnecessary criminalisation of looked after children. So if anybody is looking for that link, you need to put in unnecessary between reducing and criminalisation on page 19 at the bottom. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, could I just ask a question for care, le care leavers in suitable accommodation? Does this include um, care leavers who stay put with their foster carers? Okay, I just wanted to double check. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I just want to ask one quick question. Um, you mentioned backlog in court, that um, there's a lot of backlog in the court in, for the hearing of many cases. That's why we couldn't help more people. I just want to know how soon can this backlog be cleared so that we can help more um, children in care? So we are having regular meetings with our colleagues in CAFCAS, so, the, um, so our guardians. We're having regular meetings with the judiciary to have conversations about delaying court proceedings. We know that things are being timetabled at the moment for October, the final hearings. And so they're prioritising babies, younger children, where adoption is the plan. Um, so we're hoping that we'll start to get on, on track, but it's going to take a little while. And so they're looking at remote hearings, looking at where there's spaces within the court and trying to make sure that they're prioritising those cases that need their permanency decided. Thank you very much. Uh, so, sorry, Chair, I, I think I might have missed something, but the Chair of the Children Care Council asked a question and... Oh, right. Oh, okay. Sorry, was that shared with everybody? So the, the, uh, the question was about whether or not suitable accommodation included um, young staying people who are staying put, and the answer is yes, it did. Oh, right, okay. Sorry, Thank uh, you. I think my colleague answered it, but she didn't put a microphone on. <laughs> Sorry, I thought, I thought I'd gone to sleep or something. Yeah, momentarily. Can I just ask one really quick, uh, just a quick request on this report, because I'm, I'm assuming this is one that comes to us quite regularly. Um, in sec Sorry. section three... Um, it lists the breakdown of children of um, uh, children looked after by gender and ethnicity and age, but there's no information on disability, which, from my sort of previous experience, does sort of play a big role in kind of the composition of um, care leavers. So, sorry, not care leavers, but for uh, children being looked after. Could we have that information in a future report? Is that okay? Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. We now have to go to item six. Um, can officer, you know, take this one off for us? Thank you. So this report gives an overview of the youth offending service, the impact that the pandemic has had on the courts, which we've already discussed briefly, and service delivery. The report will set out the six strategic priorities identified by the Youth Crime Governance Board for the Youth Justice Plan 21 to 24, and the report will also provide information and data on the role of the youth offending service with children looked after. YOS is based in Corringham, close to the town centre, fully staffed with all permanent members and a number of seconded staff from a number of um, other agencies. The impact of COVID has meant that the Youth Offending Service has had to deliver services to young people in different ways over the last year because the office based was closed for long periods of time. They've had to be quite creative to ensure that the young people have been able to complete the work for their court orders and have every chance not to repeat offending behaviours. Every three years, the Youth Crime Governance Board has to complete a strategic plan for the Youth Justice Board of England and Wales, and that's part of our grant agreement. 
and the priorities that have been agreed across that multi-agency board is violence and vulnerability, education, training and employment, diversion and out-of-court disposals, early help and prevention, effective partnerships and evidence-based practice. And two themes are evident within all of those six priorities and those themes focus on the disproportionality of BAME youths and looked after children within the criminal justice system. So just looking at some data, um, 3.1, which is reoffending, which is the Ministry of Justice data. And as you can see, the table shows the latest published reoffending data by the Ministry of Justice, and that's for April 29 to March 2020, which is always published a year later. And the YOS continues to outperform all its comparators and is over 10% below the national average. So with Thurrock, quarterly and aggregated yearly is at 25%. Thurrock Youth Offending also reports on local data, and this is the performance that is recorded on the corporate scorecard. That data is dynamic, does have a three-month drag, but as quarter three, the 2021 data, the reoffending rate is at 7%, and that figure is accumulative through that tracked period of time. As Thurrock is a small YOS and consequently has a small quarterly and yearly cohort compared to most youth offending services, the annual data can show as being erratic, but the performance remains good with Thurrock outperforming all comparators and being below the national average since the year 2014 to 2015. We're also measured by our first time entrants and the first time entrants were relatively static for some time as a result of the introduction of preventative services in 20, 2011. However, this financial year has seen initially the closure of the youth courts as a result of COVID-19 restrictions and then a delay in processing cases to conclusion. This meant a reduction of the first two quarters and the latest indicators from Essex Court Service state, state that there is a backlog of 117% in the overall court system, although that figure is not exclusive to youth cases. If I move on to 3.5 and the youth of custody, the final custody figure for 2020 to 21 was 0.05 per thousand young people, which is below the national average of 0.14 and our, our and our identified comparators. This only applies to those young people sentenced to custody and not those remanded or made subject to youth detention accommodation. So since this data was finalised, two young people have received custodial sentences and three young people have been remanded in custody awaiting trial. Whilst on remand, these young people are classified as children looked after. So the children looked after 15 accounted for 20% of statutory outcomes in 2019 and 20. The figures remained static for 2020 to 2021. And there's no nationally published comparator for the period. But children looked after remain overrepresented despite the introduction of the national protocol to reduce the criminalisation of children looked after. During the period 2020 to 21, one child looked after was made subject to a custodial sentence and three children have received a looked after status because of youth detention accommodation remands and these are included in the data. In relation to out of court disposals, there is a panel that is multi-agency that meets once a fortnight and they aim to divert children from future involvement in the criminal justice system in the best interests of the child and the criminal justice system. It will make decisions in respect of children who have made full admissions to committing low-level offences and who are not serious or prolific offenders. Offences deemed suitable for an out-of-court disposal are those offences which have a gravity score of 1, 2 or 3, so that's low to medium in seriousness, and offences which are gravity score 4, so medium to high in seriousness, will continue to be excluded unless in exceptional circumstances and will be referred to the CPS for a charging decision. So looking at the table, during 2021, um, the out-of-court disposal 
panel dealt with 43 offences relating to 33 children. In line with court-ordered interventions, the most common offences were where these, those were under the Violence Against the Person Act. It should be noted that the period in question, and particularly the throughput, was initially affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the first year we have had comparative data in relation to out-of-court disposals. So looking at the children's social care status for those children that have been to the out-of-court disposal panel. So the blue um, part was where they had no social care history or were not open. The red is the looked after and the green is children in need. So 44% of those children were open to children's social care at the time of the offence. 10 with children in need status, five with looked after status, so they were children looked after at the time of the offence. Concerns were raised at the presentation of the quarter two data as to whether children looked after were receiving the same opportunities for diversion away from the criminal justice system as those in the general population. This has now increased to 50%, 15% from 0% in quarter two, which is a significant improvement. Moving on now to 3.9 in relation to the Youth Justice Plan. So that has recently been signed off by the Youth Crime Governance Board and the delivery of the plan is monitored via that board. The plan sets out those six strategic priorities and the following vision for the Youth Justice Partnership. So that recognises the need of the children it works with and will increase their resilience by providing a multi-agency response designed to pre prevent offending, safeguard children and protect the community. The board maintains that vision that identifies children as children and highlights the need to build on their strengths to allow them to make a constructive contribution to society. The Youth Justice Plan also shares our Youth Justice Justice Board vision and remains committed to the youth justice aims and set out in, in their youth justice strategic plan, which also underpins our strategic priorities. That sounds a bit garbled, doesn't it? Sorry. It just means the Youth Justice Board have their own strategic plan and ours is in line with theirs. Um, a child first approach is also central and um, focuses on prevention of child's needs and strengths, and Thurrock Youth Justice Plan continues to promote that child-first approach. People remain that priority for Thurrock, where partnerships work together to improve health and wellbeing, and that remains integral to the vision of the borough. The plan sets out the main areas of focus and activity against those priorities that are realistic in the current environment. Similarly, the plan takes into account the reduction in any resources. So the work of the YOS set out within the plan is directly linked to the priority to reduce overall levels of crime and antisocial behaviour, which is also in line with the community safety partnership targets. And there is a close alignment to the local public health plan around violence and vulnerability. So that is, um, that's the end of my report. Thank you very much. Do members have any comments or questions? Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for the report. Um, just, just wondering, on page 38 at 3.9, uh, people remain a priority for Thurrock where partnerships work together. Uh, it's, there's a mention there that the, the uh, demographic of the borough continues to change along with the offending cohort and nature of offending. What, what do we feel, how is the change and how is that affecting the young people? Is it more aggravated, uh, violent uh, crimes or uh, are, are there other things coming into play? I'm thinking more of county lines and those type of things, which I think is a big concern for everybody. Yeah, there has been an increase in county lines activity. There's also been an increase in, in violent crimes, which some do and some don't relate to organised criminal, criminal gangs. Councillor McDonald. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, just a general point in relation to the um, recommendations, and this was so for the last report. The members note the contents of this report and consider the continued improvements made. I can see that there are some improvements, most notable that the out-of-court disposal panel has actually got, um, is actually registering now for our, our um, looked after children, so that's good to see. Um, in general, with the second recommendation, for our members to identify any specific areas they would like additional information for any sub subsequent reports, obviously the Youth Justice Plan um, has only recently been signed off and it's it's a vision rather than a very detailed plan. Um, I found it was quite difficult to grasp what that would mean or what that would look like and how what kind of outcomes that would be providing for children on the ground. Um, specifically, I want to ask about the reduction in resources on page that's referred to on page 38. Um, in future reports, what I would like to see is how specifically the vision would be achieved. So the real um, meat on the bones of that. An example of the kind of thing that could possibly show me that, um, if we go back to page 34, when we were, you talk about the youth offending service being having to be creative during COVID um, with the... Um, office actually closed for a lot of the time due to COVID, sort of some detail about how um, they were creative in order to see people. Presumably some of that would, would be online, but maybe there were other things, um, and how they helped um, offenders not to repeat offending behaviour. That would be an example, maybe some case studies, just things like that. So um, that's specifically in relation to recommendation 1.2. That that would be the kind of thing that I'd want to see coming back if the, when the report comes back again. Um, specific things, maybe you could answer now about the how, how were the creative, the youth offending service, and specifically what is the reduction in resources. I'd also like to acknowledge the... Um, Reoffending rates being what ten percent lower than any statistical neighbours, but it was significant anyway. So um, that, that's good to see. Um, although that was a maintenance rather than an improvement, because that's that's been quite stable for for a number of, for for a period of time. Thank you. So I can respond to um, the reduction resources um, relates to a grant that we receive from the Youth Justice Board for children who are on remand. Um, there, is a, there is a cost to the local authority for any child that's placed under youth detention and the, the grant given to us um, is significantly, it, it goes down year on year, and unfortunately our remand costs go up year on year. How, how are we supposed to fill that gap? We do. Oh. <laughs> so this is from... But the responsibility comes back on to the council and the general fund has to fund... I think what Claire's particularly talking about, if, if a child is remanded into custody, they become a looked after child until conviction. Whilst they're on remand, the bill for that remand comes to the local authority. So the courts decide to remand young people without any, obviously, well, that little reference to us. Um, and then the council will pick up the bill and that tends to go into our placements budget bill. And the price can range from it's sort of four thousand to seven thousand pound a week for a child to be remanded into custody. So that's a significant, ever-growing cost. It certainly is. What what can we what can we do about that? Because I mean, presumably at some point that becomes unsustainable. I, I think the key is about 
prevention and try and obviously for young people not to be remanded into custody. And certainly our YOS will offer other alternatives in the community and bail support. Um, the recent increase has been young people who have committed quite serious um, knife crimes and have involved injury to other young people. And, you know, you can sort of see that the court probably didn't have a lot of um, options in terms of what happened to those young people. Um, so, yes, it is something that as a council, you know, we can't always predict. So from year to year, there may be very few remands and then, you know, we have a spate of violence or retribution that sort of thing and then next thing we've got sort of two maybe three young people remanded into custody as soon as as soon as they are either convicted or found not guilty then we don't have to pay the cost so if they are convicted and then get a sentence that might be custody then the cost doesn't come to the local authority and if they are found not guilty and then released then the same thing it's not to the local authority. And at the moment, because the courts have got a bit of time to catch up because of how COVID has impacted on them, it means some of those young people are spending longer on remand awaiting trial. Thank you. Bella Bodkin. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I was, I was quite interested in, in this section 3.8 about the out-of-court um, disposal panel. Um, apologies if you did say this and I missed this, but um, the last line is this has now increased to 15% from 0% in quarter two, which is an improvement. How does that benchmark against the general population, if that's a meaningful figure? Uh, there isn't a benchmarking um, currently, but I could, I could go away and have a look to see if I could give you some additional information on that. Yeah, it would be interesting because obviously that, that is a big improvement, but it, it, it would be interesting to know kind of kind of what, what those differentials are. And it would be really interesting sort of following on from what you were saying um, in relation to out-of-court disposal panels on the previous item um, and also in reference to Councillor Maldonado's point about the, the resourcing for, for kind of remand, etc. It would be really interesting if we could have more information um, about out-of-court disposal panels because that sounds like a really interesting... Um, a really interesting uh, well, piece of work that, that's obviously going to affect both council resources but also um, children's outcomes and life chances because we know that once children get into the criminal justice system it's quite hard to get them back out of it. So it'd be really interesting to have a look at that in a bit more detail at a future session. That's fine. I don't think I've answered all of your questions, did I? in relation to how will be creative and a bit more around the youth justice plan because I just sent everybody the, the plan on a page just to say that there is a really detailed plan that sits underneath this um, which I'm quite happy to to share if if anyone would be interested if it doesn't this is just the the plan on the page everything else sits underneath it's rather large I'd certainly be interested to have a look at it. I <laughs> can't speak for everybody else, but um, yeah, that would be very kind if you would uh, send the link or, or, or the document. Oh, that's fine. I can do that. Um, and there was also the question around the creativity. How are they creative? Um, yes, obviously a lot of things moved to be online. There were other... Um, some of our young people that are at higher risk um, of, of serious harm and, and high risk of safeguarding need to be visited face to face. Um, during COVID, it was quite difficult to do that. Um, so, especially going into family homes. So we were just creative with meeting young people in open spaces and doing some work with them there. Some of the reparation work, um, sometimes known as the community payback, um, everything was done outside rather than than doing decorating or something within inside so that they tried to be as creative as possible because what we didn't want is those young people not to have fulfilled um all of the um priorities and and actions that they needed to do within their order so we just made sure that we we just tried to be as creative as possible but it's a lot easier now we can see them face to face in the building so Thank you very much. That gives a really good. That gives me a really good picture of what the kinds of things that, that you're doing to um, 
um, help that and help help them not reoffend. Thank you, Councillor Polly. Thank you, Chair. Um, just thinking about an earlier conversation where we was asking about Thurrets looked after children if they then progressed on to further education, university outside of the borough, that they are still our responsibility as they as you own child would be. Some of the talking about the county lines, children going on to remand, are, are some of these um, young people that have been put on remand, the offence has been caught like committed in Thurrock. Are those young people Thurrock people or are they county lines people that have moved in and then we're picking up the remand costs? I just wonder if we know the answer to that. Thank you. They are all Thurrock residents. Um, I'm not saying that they've all been here for a long length of time. We do have some of the London boroughs moving families into Thurrock where there are issues around gang related violence. So they tend to be moved here for their own safety. Um, and however, they then get drawn back into that way of, of, of life and tend to also go back to the boroughs that they came from and commit the crimes there. Um, we do have some that have committed crimes in Thurrock, but more often than not, they are committed outside of Thurrock, but they are Thurrock young people. Any more questions? Okay, I have one quick question. Uh, because I always associate knife crime to London problem. Do we have um, big issues about knife crime in Thurrock? It's not at the extent of the London boroughs, um, but we do have an increasing um, cohort of young people that are becoming involved in knife-related crimes and gang-related violence. Questions? No? Thank you. We will now move to item seven. Report for members on missing children, child exploitation, return home interviews, and co-sexual safeguarding focused on children looked after. Can I ask officer to introduce this report? It's me again. Um, so yes, this is, this is the report um, for you, which gives an overview of the work that's taken place since January 2020 and part of the improvement journey. Um, Ofsted undertook that in the inspection of services in November 2019, and obviously we got the, um, the outcome of good, but they did identify that the, that the following area needed to be improved, and that's the alignment and effectiveness of systems that support children at risk of criminal and sexual exploitation and children missing from home and care to ensure that children can tell their stories. So following that inspection in November 2019, um, we commissioned a consultant with a focus on child exploitation to undertake some improvement work with us for three months. And that included um, a review and rewrite re of the child exploitation and vulnerability risk assessment tool. So social workers really had the clarity about the factors that placed a child at risk of exploitation and included um, some scaling to identify whether children were classified as low, medium or high risk. There was also a planning tool that brought together the whole partnership that helped safeguard young people at medium and high risk and a new strategy meeting template that provided guidance to the social workers of the additional professionals required to disrupt and reduce those risks. Training to staff was given on how to use those templates and an introduction to contextual safeguarding. 
and that is an approach to assessing and planning for abuse that occurs outside of the family home, in schools, the community, via peer groups. And in order to do that effectively, it needs input from professionals from a wider network. So that includes community safety, police, the youth offending service, housing, trading standards and licensing. And we also improved our data reporting on child exploitation and missing children. So we've also introduced some further changes to practice. So we have monthly tracking meetings that look at individual cases. Um, there has been a refresh of the weekly risk management meetings and they look specifically at missing children and plan for their safety. Um, and we changed in April 2020, the commissioning for the return home interviews were changed from open door to inspire with clear performance indicators that are monitored monthly. There's been ongoing training for children's social care staff on gangs, child exploitation and contextual safeguarding and they're delivered quarterly. There's been training to taxi drivers, hotel staff on child exploitation and how to identify and report concerns. We've recruited a child exploitation and missing, missing children manager who coordinates and supports individual workers. There's been recruitment of gangs and child exploitation senior practitioner within the youth offending team. And she works alongside the case managers in the YOS and also social workers to support and upskill them in working with high risk cases. There's been additional support to schools and colleges to identify young people and their peer groups at risk and provide interventions. There's been auditing of cases where child exploitation and missing children are the focus and improvements in practice have been evidenced. There are bi-monthly contextual safeguarding reports which identify those children that are most at risk and the places and the peer groups that they associate with in order to disrupt that, those activities. There's been extensive mapping, including the early identification of young people who may be involved with or on the periphery of gang activity in Thurrock, involving partner agencies to support that diversion and disruption and enforcement activity. We have child exploitation champions identified within the social work teams to drive performance and interventions. And there have been a number of operations across Thurrock, Southend and Essex that includes targeted support on trains and transport hubs to identify young people at risk. So 3.1 missing children. So Thurrock records all missing episodes for children looked after. These episodes may be for an hour or less rather than days. Foster carers and placement providers are required to follow the council's procedures and report young people missing to the police and advise the service if they are unaware of the young person's whereabouts. So if a child is not home by an agreed time. Once the child's returned home, a return home interview will be held with the child through Inspire. Often the same children have had a repeat episode of missing and each episode is recorded, which contributes to the overall number. Um, there's a graph within here that shows a fluctuating picture in the number of missing episodes across the year. In 2021, we had a total of 402 missing episodes and that related to 52 children, including 10 unaccompanied asylum seeking children. 400 of these episodes were for short periods and the young people returned to their placements. Two unaccompanied asylum seeking children were missing from care from the 31st of March 2021. A lot of this data was actually already um, has already been given in the first report by Mandy Moore, so I'm not going to um, to labour this too much because you've probably heard most of this. So just to to show that um, the return home interviews are an opportunity for young people go missing to talk about that experience and share where they've been, who they've been with, and any other details. And some examples of the reasons given is that they want to be with their friends, they don't like their placement, their placement is too far away, and that they've been placed there without any discussion. Those return home interviews that are completed are of good quality and are used towards contextual safeguarding, planning and mapping exercises and are shared with the social workers to support their work with the children. 
we did the data um, for the return home interviews in the first report, so I won't give that again. So the oversight and planning for children con considered at risk of exploitation, that's 3.3. So contextual safeguarding is an approach to understanding and responding to young people's experiences of significant harm beyond their families. It recognises that the different relationships that young people form in their neighbourhoods, schools and online can feature violence and abuse. So Thurrock has four operational structures overseen by the Thurrock Local Safeguarding Children's Partnership and the Community Safety Partnership, the Thurrock Violence and Vulnerability Board, which supports the sharing of information and planning together, with, together using a contextual perspective. So we have the, the Thurrock MACE meetings there every six weeks, and that collates information and data from partners to help to identify developing child exploitation and exploitive concerns across the borough to inform collaborative, strategic and operational responses to safeguard, protect victims and to target and disrupt with a view to prosecute possible perpetrators. As previously said, we have the risk management meeting that's held weekly and reviews all the cases um, of reported missing episodes from the week prior and those who are assessed to be high risk of CSC or CE or those children who are currently being exploited. The RMM provides an opportunity for the multi-agency network to share information and plan. We have child exploitation tracker meetings and that's an internal operational CE tracker which supports social workers and their managers with CSC and CE cases ensuring strategy meetings the risk and vulnerability assessments, the risk management plans are completed in timescales and that these processes are supporting the care planning and safeguarding of children and young people at risk of exploitation. We also have the Gang Related Violence Forum, also known as the GRV, and that is a youth offending-led multi-agency forum which meets monthly and has oversight of gang nominals and those that are at risk of being exploited across the borough. Multi-agency plans are developed and put in place that reduce the risk of harm, manage safety and well-being and look at gang exit strategies. So we've put all of this in place, but what is the impact of the work that's been undertaken? So the audits that have been undertaken in children's social care have highlighted that the work done so far regarding child exploitation has improved our practice over the last year. And practitioners are familiar now with CE issues and the safety planning to support this. The exploitation manager reaches out to various agencies to continue raising awareness of CE through training and multi-agency meetings. This is supporting positive relationships as well as identifying crucial hotspots and patterns of concern. There are monthly meetings with the Community Safety Partnership Police, Trading Standards and any other relevant partners to advise them of any concerns and actions required to minimise and disrupt risk. The number of um, thorough children going missing has declined year on year over the last three years. There is good management oversight of the missing cases and children are routinely offered their return home interviews. And there are effective strategic responses to operational information which can be evidenced within the South End, Essex and Thurrock and multi-agency partnership approaches to child exploitation. Practitioners now becoming familiar with the, with the child exploitation champions across children and families and are actively seeking their advice. And there's been 45 separate consultations in the last three months. The information that arises from the return home interviews are being used to inform strategic safeguarding approaches such as identifying spaces, places and peer group associations that have led to some successful planning in disruption from other agencies. And the operational link between the CE and missing lead encourages information sharing and opening up links with partner agencies, including detailed information that's shared at the risk management meetings. And that's led to robust multi-agency safety plans being implemented to reduce risks. The involvement with several of South End Essex and Thurrock projects has aimed to support raising the awareness of those hard to reach agencies and providing a consistent approach. And the ongoing delivery of the training is continuing to develop practice in understanding exploitation 
not just with our partner agencies, but also internally with practitioners and is receiving positive feedback. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Do member have any comments or questions? Thank you, Cancelo. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report. Um, I was just wondering, in Section 3.1, it says that two unaccompanied asylum seekers were missing from care on 31st of March. I was just wondering if we could get an update on whether they are, they've been found and they're safe, um, and also if we could just have an idea of how many children are missing as we speak. No, they're not found. That they're still missing. Mm. Okay. And missing children as we speak. I'm not sure. Two, clearly. But two unaccompanied asylum seeking children. So could I just while you're finding that number out, in terms of unaccompanied asylum seeking children, it's a national issue that some young people that come and are unaccompanied asylum seekers may already have plans about where they want to be when they come here um, and then go missing, usually very quickly. If they're going to go missing, as in we really don't know where they are, they do go missing within two or three days of arriving. Um, for those young people, they are all reported to the police. We have um, six weekly meetings constantly checking to see have the police got any idea of their whereabouts or know where they are. Some of those young people are discovered elsewhere and then come back into our care. Um, but as I say, it, it is a worrying um, issue. There's also issues around um, age assessments of unaccompanied asylum seekers that arrive in the country. Um, we do what's called a brief age assessment and unless we think a young person is significantly over the age of 21, if they say they're 17 or 16, we have to accept that age. So there is, there's a lot of complexities. Um, when those young people do go missing from their placements, we make sure that we've informed all the authorities, including border agencies, everyone that needs to know, and we keep having regular meetings so we don't lose sight of those young people. Um, just for, hopefully for your assurance. I can see one of our foster carers has had some unaccompanied asylum seeking young people. I don't know if you want to comment at all, Sharon. Yeah, it's just, it's very difficult when, when they've already got ideas. Um, you know, we try to take phones off of them and things like that, but they're very good at hiding things. They already have addresses. Um, you know, they've remembered things, you know, no phone numbers, so they can find you know a phone from someone even if they haven't got one and you know then they've gone so you know it is worrying you do get concerned about it but also sometimes you know you're also not sure whether they are 17 or 24 or 25 so you know these two young people could actually even be adults it's very difficult to know i mean i don't know the identities of the actual young people so it's difficult to see Thank you for that. Just to, just to follow up, in, in terms of the fact that th there are these kind of possibly sometimes laid ahead plans, that would suggest that they are incredibly vulnerable to child exploitation um, because they're not going to something, you know, they're not going to go and work in, you know, Morrison's or whatever, are they? They're, they're, they're going to something that might be some form of exploitation in terms of gang masters and that sort of thing. So it's in incredibly sort of concerning for their welfare isn't it i'm just wondering sheila is is six weeks six weekly meetings on this is that short if, is that that seems like quite a long time between a discussion i'm sure there must be discussions in between as well if 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 there's any information before the six weeks so if the police or any other agency discovers these young people's whereabouts obviously we we will go into action straight away six weeks is the gap in between that we've set. This is not a national requirement. And in fact, um, in when Ofsted came in 2019, they raised that as good practice because a lot of local authorities do not monitor and track once the young people have gone missing for a period of time, but, but we do. Okay, so I just wanted to, because so when we were having the training earlier and Janet was sort of talking very passionately about kind of how would we feel if it was our children 
you know, and if they were missing for six weeks, I'd want people to be knocking on the door of the police every single day <laughs> to, to say, why haven't you found them, where are they? So it's just six weeks does feel like quite a long period of time, but I mean, obviously it sounds positive if it's not, if it's not something that other local authorities are doing, but it, it does feel like quite a chunk of time, a month and a half. So the biggest issue for us is that the young people are not known to us and we don't know their network, so it's not as if it were your child you would know or you might have an idea which, which families, which parents, which area your young person might be in. Um, also trying to follow them on social media is not always possible either because they go quite quickly, if they're going to go. So the majority of um, unaccompanied asylum seekers that arrive, don't they stay in our care and they get if they go into the eastern region protocol they get moved to another local authority so they don't go missing it's a very small few that who do go missing and, and you're absolutely right you know they they probably have somewhere that they're going to but it isn't necessarily somewhere we might want them to be going to so we also report them to the national referral mechanism which is a national mechanism again about trying to track young people across the country because as i say this is um Unfortunately, it is a national issue. It's not just particular to Thurrock, but as we are port of entry, we do get more unaccompanied asylum seekers arriving um, spontaneously in the authority than in certainly any other authority in the eastern region. We're not on the same level as Kent and Dover, but we are a port of authority and we do get spontaneous arrivals into our local authority. Thank you. Do we have any figures on the return of uh, unaccompanied asylum seekers that do go missing? We, we, we obviously, as Sheila said, we keep an eye on them and we review them six weekly. Um, by and large, I mean, when I arrived in Thurrock in 2018, I think we had a larger number of unaccompanied asylum seekers who were missing. Those numbers have gone down because we've been quite vigilant in, I think it was Mintara or Claire had said that what, one of the things we do is to, and, and Sharon is that we take phones away. We try to kind of um, give them opportunities to stay in the placement, try and get them settled. So we know that the numbers are going down. So currently we have two unaccompanied asylum seekers that are looked after that are missing. Um, we've got four children missing in totality that are, are looked after. And they're all aged, so the unaccompanied asylum seekers are 16 and 17, according to the given age that they gave when they arrived in the country. And then the two that are non-asylum seekers are 17 and 16. They're young people who, and some of there's some lag in the system in terms of they may have come back this morning or late last night, and it's about because the, the information is based on what was reported last night because it updates each morning. Um, so often we know the next day where they are. So we don't have huge amounts of children missing on a daily basis from our looked after population. But in terms of unaccompanied asylum seekers, we know that the numbers have gone down. And part of that is because the work we've done to try and keep those children in placement wherever we can and actually making sure we're having those conversations with border force, making sure we've got pictures of young people so that we've got some idea, some way of tracking them. And sometimes young people will turn up in a different country um, and we'll find that they've maybe made an asylum application elsewhere as well. So there can be various reasons why this happens. Thank you. Councillor Polly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm making the assumption that the missing children um, obviously our children that we looked at and the children that are on residential pay, the placements and that, they're all accounted for as well? Yes, that includes all of the looked after children population. We, we, we spoke quite a bit about how COVID has impacted um, all services um, right across the board. Um, a, a lot of this report work refers to multi agencies um a lot of the services were diminished or restricted because of the covid uh, i'm just wondering if there was a reduction of eyes and ears on the street and such as health visitors education um 
uh, facilities, schools and things, and that teachers noticing differences in children. Um, w was there any thought at looking at the agencies, such as perhaps the ambulance service, that was still going out and has got access to people's homes? Uh, was there any contact with them? Like, because you sort of lost a lot of resources. Or have you looked at um, just flagging up another resource to to highlight some of these issues? Thank you. So obviously we get a number of referrals from a number of sources. Um, so what you could see through the pandemic was at times of lockdown, um, the numbers in terms of police referrals might go up. And then at times of children going back to school, you see the school numbers go up. I mean, our schools have been fantastic. You know, they've gone above and beyond. And they've worked really closely with families, going out to them, delivering food parcels, having conversations, you know, are looked after children. Um, we've encouraged them to continue to go to school. Obviously, their foster carers are there to make sure that their needs are being met. And so any changes in the children, so we've had referrals from schools if a child, if they've gone round and they've, and they hear things in the community that we don't hear. So they would come back and say, we've heard that X child has been out, out and about doing certain things or they're not kind of being supervised appropriately. So I think, you know, despite the schools not being in, we know that they've actually been absolutely vigilant in terms of making sure that children are be children's needs are being made, met. I mean, health visitors, um, you know, a lot of people have been working remotely. But I think where people are at in the community, they have been contacting us and having those conversations. We, um, we have a MASH in Thurrock and those multi-agency partners were still working, albeit remotely in the same way we were. Um, our, our family assessment teams have been working on duty, coming into the office throughout the pandemic and making sure they're going out and seeing children. So I think wherever possible, all of those kind of things are still taking place. And we know that there's been an impact on children's mental health. And so we're kind of really um, sort of embracing anybody really who's got information about children, who know the children that we're working to see if they can kind of give us any information. So I think people have, we've continued to get referrals. Our referrals have gone down slightly, but actually we've continued to get referrals and we're still seeing children. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the report. Um, I was glad to see that from the return home interviews that those are actually fed back into the contextual safeguarding. So I just wanted to touch a little bit on the on the part of the area of improvement that is about children being able to tell their stories and also about how the children's child's voice is heard within the context of um, child exploitation. So that, that was a good area for me. I like the, the examples that, that were given there. It gave a good feel of the kind of reasons why children um, do go missing um, and good sharing in. In terms of the more governance areas, so the meetings, the tracking meetings, etc. How is the child's voice being fed back into those kind of strategic meetings? Child's voice is, is always the main focus. So um, what, what happens is, so we have the return home interviews, the information from the young person, so that child's opportunity to give their perspective, to give their opinion, um, and to give us more of an understanding is fed back um, through the risk management meetings, and then subsequently will we'll be um, looked at more general in, in some of our strategic meetings and will be fed into some of our, our development board reports so that we know what are the issues for these specific young people. Then we can then make sure that the social workers are aware, the team managers are aware, everybody is aware what the issues are and try and rectify those and try and disrupt that form of, of activity. So can I just add something? Yeah. So I suppose the other thing is as well, in terms of strategic, um, how we, we look at those issues strategically, as Claire said, it's about kind of hearing sort of what are the themes that are coming through from young people. So 
in the meetings, I mean, for example, if I was chairing a meeting, a strategic meeting about missing young people or return home interviews, what I'd want to hear is what is the message that's coming back for children and then developing some plans from that. So if one of, and in terms of speaking to children about how they feel, one of the things young people say is um, I'm not listened to. Um, I'm 17 now, but I'm still being asked to come in at, I don't know, 10 o'clock. They're not kind of listening to me. So part of the conversations we've been having more recently is, you know, if you've got a child at home and they're 17 years old, would we be kind of reporting them missing within 10 minutes? So are we having conversations and trying to kind of um, have a balance between making children are safe, making sure children are safe, but also kind of giving them some level of freedom? Because if I was 17 and I told you I was going to be at friend X and then I was 10 minutes late home and you sent the police around to friend X, I probably would never tell you where I was again because I wouldn't want the police coming to my friends' homes. So I think it's about trying to have those conversations, using that rich information to kind of inform our plans going forward and how we work with young people. Thank you. Any more questions? My question to the officer is this. What measures are, are in place to prevent unaccompanied asylum seekers from going missing? So um, the, we've been working with the police on op interstay and that is a change from our previous um, approach. So. With Op Interstay, they used to treat new um, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. They'd caution them as if they were criminals, and they would arrest them for um, immigration offences. So we've been working with the police in order to, to re-focus um, on the child. So when, the, when it's a child who enters into the country who hasn't got an immigration status, um, that we, instead of um, arresting them, we, we, tell that we take a police protection now and we tell them that they're going to be safe and we support them so that they're not... So that, so that anything that traffickers may have told them about the trouble that they might get into with authorities, that we're working to support them and we explain that they're going to be safe and, and they haven't done anything wrong and there's no conviction and there's no criminality. So it's a different, that's one of the approaches that um, we've been working with. The reason why I don't understand that is that I think every asylum seeker should be first of all treated as if there are some sort of danger to the community until they are proven not to be. For example, now if somebody go missing within four days, we don't know who they are, whether they are criminals, whether they are danger to the society. So don't you think it will be advisable for you to allow the, co um, the police to do their job by keeping these people to, them, to themselves to show or to prove that they are not danger to the community? So as a local authority, all local authorities, there's a, a requirement for us to treat children as people who present as children, unless there's evidence to suggest otherwise, for us to treat them as children. Um, so before we can determine a child is an adult, for example, we'd have to do a full age assessment. So if a young person presents and says they're a child, then we have to see them as vulnerable as a child, and as a child they'd be vulnerable. Um, a bit like our general population, we were talking earlier about our youth offending service and an over-representation of our black and minority ethnic children in the criminal justice system. We really need to be cautious about determining that somebody may be a criminal based on the fact that they've come from, they've come in as unaccompanied asylum seekers. You know, these young people, whether they're young people or slightly older than what they're claiming, they have fled their country. They have obviously risked their life to come here. And we, there are, there are procedures and policies that we have to follow, but actually they're presenting as children and we have to treat them as children until we know otherwise. I'm not actually saying that they are criminals. What I'm trying to say is that a pre preventative measure 
to ensure that um, they are not a danger to the society because um, what Sheila said last time was that they go missing within three, four days. And if we don't know who they are and they suddenly disappear and they presented themselves at 16 and we discovered that they are 24, 25, that's what I'm thinking that. If wouldn't there be some kind of measure to prevent them from going missing? So um, I don't know if this helps, uh, Chair. When they're in that process of off interstate, that's when the police take their biometrics. So they, so they may say I'm 15, 16, 17, 18, but the the biometrics is how they match those um, unaccompanied young people coming in with, for example, an asylum claim they might have made in Germany. So that's so. For example, we might have uh, three young people come in, two are new uh, claimants for asylum, and one, the police will say, well, actually, they won't say it necessarily on the day, but they'll come back and they'll say, oh, this young person has already claimed asylum in um, Germany. So there is, I think that's what you're checking, that they don't enter and we don't have any of the information, but there's a whole biometric process that the police take. And they used to do that through arresting the young people and treating them as criminals. And now they're doing the biometrics, but they're also saying, we don't need to arrest you. You haven't committed a criminal offence. We're, we're treating you as a child. And we will then place you in the care of the local authority and you'll be taken care of. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can now understand where you're coming from. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this is a report to the Corporate Parenting Committee on fostering recruitment strategy for Thurrock. So the report provides an outline to the committee of what we're proposing for fostering recruitment. The service has, in conjunction with the communications service, refreshed the Thurrock fostering brand. And with the launch of the new brand, there is a new marketing strategy. This report provides the highlights of the changes and outline of the events that are planned to create increased opportunities for the recruitment of foster carers. I wasn't proposing to read the report word for word, but I was going to just um, summarise some of the key issues. So um, just so the committee are um, aware, why, are, why do we have a fostering recruitment strategy? And we're expected to have um, an overview of what our placement sufficiency is and we have a sufficiency um, statutory duty to know what we need for our young people and children coming into care. So I've outlined that. So what are the different options that we have got um, for a child when they're unable to live with their birth family or a range of options um, because they're living away from their own family and their own home? So they live with foster carers or they reside with family or friends or um, a family of the child. And these carers are known as connected carers. So we do have a good track record in the Thurrock of um, supporting family to take care of their own children. And we can support them either as foster carers, connected carers, or we support them to take special guardianship orders both of which are financially supported by the local authority. I won't summarise the numbers of children are looked at, who are looked after because we heard from Mandy earlier this evening. In terms of um, the ethnic background of our children and the foster carers' ethnic background, you can see that there's not an exact match 
but what we would emphasize and for those of you who were at the training earlier is that it's we're not here to to just match to um necessarily ethnic um backgrounds it, the match is about culture it's about home life it's about rules boundaries family life and what suits individual children so what we do want to know what we do want to ensure is that if we are placing cross culturally that our foster carers are prepared and able and skilled to be able to do that so we do have um, with the black lives matter agenda we've been reinvigorating our training program we've um, been delivering um, blm training so that we've got appropriate care for children who are looked after who may have culturally and um, ethnically diverse needs and that includes their religion um, their skin their hair um, what we have is a is an open approach to discussing and reflecting in terms of uh, the social worker for the child and for the fostering social worker to be able to discuss that with the um, foster carers so um, we have highlighted the recruitment data earlier and hopefully um, we're able to see that although we haven't been increasing um, significantly the fostering households what we are actually able to do is to um, sustain what we currently have available I've just put the flow chart uh, in so that it gives a flavor of how complex it is to become a foster carer it is a, it is at minimum um, a 16 week assessment process but there is a lot of effort and um, huge amount of activity to ensure that we get that initial inquiry which is is the focus of this report tonight so there's a lot of um, attrition um, as you go through that flow chart so people may think I want to be a foster carer they have the um, initial inquiry they get their application pack they go to an information session and then they think actually my circumstances um, aren't exactly appropriate at the moment for fostering so they might come back so we've had some people who um, have, were thinking about moving and they said okay well we we really want to do fostering but we can't at the moment because we we were thinking about putting our house up for sale so and um, sometimes you get big life events that people want to um, do before they continue on their fostering journey so um, we have a very ambitious target of 20 new fostering households and that um, we want to try and reduce the numbers of children who are placed in independent fostering agencies. So we want to do that also because of um, the points that Janet's raised earlier to support our Thurrock children being in Thurrock, attending Thurrock schools and accessing Thurrock healthcare. It's much more um, facilitative of family life, of meeting family, of growing up in the community in which you are already living. So whilst the number of children they come into care because, because of their home circumstances and being very vulnerable, they still have to navigate those relationships and and family relationships even though they're not living with that family and it's and it is easier to have that within a um, and within their community so in table four um, what you can see is the the rate of um, attrition so for example um, if I take you to the number of inquiries, the total number of inquiries for the financial year 2020 to 2021 was 88. So it took 88 inquiries to convert into 11 approved fostering households. And the 88 inquiries um, is generated from your marketing and your branding. So what we're hoping is that the new brand and the enhanced media campaign will promote thorough fostering 
increase those inquiries, increase the attendance of information sessions and also the initial visits. So we're hoping that this will then convert into an increased number of Thurrock approved fostering households. The, the key issues that are our hope that we're hoping to make the significant difference for the 20 households is the new brand the robust marketing campaign and the council tax offer um there are there are obviously um re uh, requirements before meeting the um council tax rebate offer but we think that that is it is exceptional um and uh, the fostering brand is on page 59. So that is uh, unique to Thurrock. We think it's diverse. We think it's inclusive. We've built on the rainbow from the NHS and um, from the LGBTQ trans um, community. And we're hoping that this will um, put us in a marketing uh, context which mirrors the NHS and mirrors... Um, other communities. So um, we are looking for um, applications obviously from residents in Thurrock but we are grateful for um, individuals who do want to foster with Thurrock and join our fostering community. Um, we did launch the brand in March uh, and we sent out the council tax letters with the new brand and we did fight very hard to be uh, in the booklet and to get that uh, promotion um, for, the, for the fostering uh, service. So um, in terms of some of the other activity we've been doing to improve our recruitment, we've been revamping the website, made it easier to apply um, to complete your information online that the um, we wanted to make it easier if you want to transfer from other fostering agencies we would welcome other um, foster carers who've got Thurrock children or if you're without children and you want to come foster for Thurrock we we have a very big welcome for you um, the the marketing opportunities were reduced as a result of COVID, so um, we have got some new areas that we can <laughs> begin to develop. We can go back to Thurrock Lakeside, um, and we've got a stand there, And but we have also had to adapt in the pandemic, and we're looking at much more internet-based um, advertisement. Um, we're using and learning from other local authorities who've moved online so that we're promoting um, Facebook, the council Twitter feed. If you could like and follow, that'd be great. Uh, Spotify and the recruitment team have continued to use and make use of the hashtag make a difference. So um, we've used some of the, <coughs> excuse me, we've used some of the um, news uh, feeds and we've used for you know so as you scroll through we've put thorough uh, fostering in the in the feed for um the news um and we're tr we've um we're working on the roundabouts as well i don't know if any councillors have seen them on the roundabouts but we we have um been very aggressive in our marketing across all of those um forums so uh, social media, news, uh, we're going out and about lakeside and also um, roundabouts and progressing to bus, bus shelters as well. We haven't really focused on the bus shelters because until people start moving around, um, we felt that it was more, people are still in their cars and there isn't, there's still quite a bit of working from home. So um, we've had a good fostering fortnight and we've been um, doing blogs and uh, promoting our uh, council tax offer. So we have shared it with the Children and Care Council, they liked it and they gave us some feedback about how they uh, liked the colours and we shared it with the Fostering um, Association. So um, I, I did want to just thank uh, Thurrock Foster Cares because they have been truly amazing and um, 
through the pandemic, they have kept children, they've worked with us. Um, some of the newly recruited foster carers that we've had um, have said we they'd have children in emergencies and actually they've decided to keep them. We do have um, a fantastic set of Thurrock foster carers and we want to grow that community um, and they're very welcoming, they've been very welcoming to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the report. And I think probably everyone here would echo your sentiments about sort of thanking Thurrock foster carers for, you know, everything they do normally and on top of um, sort of what was a really, really tough year and a, year and a half almost now. Um, I do have a question about the strategy. Um, the marketing looks lovely. The branding looks lovely. And I understand the importance of getting this kind of material in front of people and saying, you know, have you thought about fostering? I am curious, though, as to what other barriers we've identified where people have heard of fostering and have thought, I might like to do that. But there is something that, that's standing in their way. There's something that means they can't do that, even though they might be a really good foster carer. Um, I'm just wondering if we've done any research into kind of asking people, well, OK, so you... You inquired, but then you didn't go any further in the process. And obviously, that that could be, you know, just things that are outside of our control as a local authority. But it'd be really interesting to know if we've actually thought about those kind of uh, tackling those kind of barriers and sort of saying, well, are there ones that we can make easier? Is there something we can do about the process? Maybe we can't. Maybe we need the process to be like that is. But I'm just trying to understand the kind of barriers because that seems like you've got such a huge number of people expressing an interest, and then obviously, as you, as you said, kind of is. And, and that might be a necessary part of the process, but I'm just wondering. And also, sort of connected to this, you mentioned about the booklet and the fact that the marketing um, and the council tax uh, exemption has gone into the booklet. I'm just wondering if we've got any figures on if that's had any traction um, and the fostering fortnight. Again, lots of activity, but I'm just wondering about the, the kind of outcome and if there's any kind of evidence to suggest that that's having a real, making a real difference. So... Um, we do we do track why people um, aren't able to be progressed as foster carers, and sometimes that's um, it, it. It can be for a variety of reasons. They they haven't got the space. Um, they haven't they haven't really thought it through about um, other kind of factors going on in their life, or um, it's it's just their home circumstances aren't going to. Um, Kind of fit with fostering, and uh, we do we do really try um, to support foster carers uh, or people who are interested to become fostering, whether from all different walks of life. But there are circumstances where we just they some people want to progress and we can't, and then other people actually when they hear that they've got to go through an assessment, talk about themselves, go to a panel. They don't want. They don't want to enter into that um, that level of assessment or or disclosure about their lives. It is it is an intensive process, and we and rightly so because obviously we're we're placing our children in, in um, the care of people. So I think that um, there are legitimate reasons why people can't be progressed, but there are also other reasons why we we wouldn't be able to progress them as well. You wanted to know what, how we've done since Fostering Fortnight. So following the campaign um, in uh, March, there was an increase in April, and that has a, but that's tapered off in May. And I haven't got... We're obviously only just in June, so I don't know if that's made an impact. But what I do know is you it has to be relentless. And the March, the March to April, it, we were consistently the, the council tax booklet made the difference because it went to every single household in Thurrock, um, which is why we need that social media. We have to be on there and we have to be on the news feed and we have to be on the roundabouts. And we, so the, the marketing has to be not linear one thing after another. We have to kind of launch it and people have to see that brand again and again and again. Um, and, it, and it has to be flexible and responsive to 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 the environment that we're in. 
Thank you. And just to follow up on, on a couple of things you've raised about the kind of barriers, um, I'm just thinking about, you know, this sort of process of uh, people that want to go through, through the assessment. Is there anything we could do more to support people through it? Because as you say, you know, there has to be a process and it has to be robust. Um, but is there anything more we could be doing to support people through that? And I suppose this is this is a bigger question than, you know, anyone sitting in this room, I imagine. But in terms of actually space, that feels to me like possibly one of the main reasons for people that I know who said, well, I'd be interested, but I don't have a spare bedroom. And I don't know whether you need a spare bedroom or if that's a bit of a myth, which could potentially be busted, or whether it is something that you need and whether actually there is a bigger conversation to be had across the council about, well, actually, is there a way potentially that we could look at possibly helping people upsize, if you like, in order to be able to become a, a foster carer? I, I don't know if that's too kind of ambitious, but... Yeah, um, both Jenny and I actually work on the recruitment, so we see quite a lot of our new applicants that are coming in for foster care. Um, one of the issues actually we've had very often in the past that people are looking for a bigger house and they think if they foster they'll get one. So actually it's not a good, it's not a good idea to go down in that route because then you're getting people that are doing it for the wrong reasons. We get a lot of people that come along and when they hear about the assessment of things they've got to go into, um, they've got a very fairy tale idea about being a foster carer. And actually when they hear the grassroots, then they're not quite so happy about doing it because it's a big, big change for people. Uh, you don't foster as a person or as a couple, you foster as a whole family. Your extended family too have to be open to it and take it on board. Because when you take these children in, you want them to become part of your family for however long they're with you, whether it's a week or 10 years. So it's something big, so people have to really consider it. We often find that people come along, they make an application, they may come back six months later, two years later, having thought it through and come along and be excellent foster carers. But, you know, it's, it's that thing of, you know, the wheat and the chaff. Some, some things have to be looked at. And also, you know, the authority of... They have to find out if there's reasons that people can't go in for it on that side as well. So it's a, it's not as simple as it sounds that someone wants to be a carer and they just go through the process and become one. You know, it takes a lot more than that. So, so also there's an element about maybe checking in with people regularly, even if they have maybe gone quiet for a while and, and that actually they might come back to the process kind of later. Thank you. More questions? I'll give Chris the last. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the report. Um, yeah, obviously we welcome more Thorock um, foster carers, and um, unfortunately we only get black and white in our in our agenda. So I did actually go online to see it, and it looked it looks really good. Um, very nice branding and it, it, it would be appealing to somebody like me anyway I don't know how normal I am um, for the foster caring group um, but just going back to children's ethnic backgrounds because obviously um, you had identified that um, at the moment Thor Thorax foster carers are less likely to be an ethnic and cultural match for the actual population they've looked after children <clears throat> And obviously, I saw that you you um, included the colours um, for the LBTQ trans community in there. Um, but as the other the other forms of advertising, are there ethnically diverse pictures going out with that? There, there are presumably other. So that's part of the strategy as well. Yeah, I just I guess you probably would be doing that, but I wanted to check on that. Might have been quite nice to have seen seen some of those, um, as well as the overall sort of branding with our logo there. And the other question I had was: Was the rebrand done in house? We didn't get consultants in. We did we did this with in house, did we? Yeah. We, we did it in house, yes, and um, we we ha we've been having a little bit of debate around the the images that go with the branding, so that's why we haven't got those yet. Just 
we're still agreeing them so we've just been going out with the branding and it's on the kind of um all of the banners etc we've just made them colorful at the moment but we'll build on that with the um the pictures uh, which we're just we're still deciding what they're going to be thank you yeah i did like i did like the idea of the um, rainbow also sort of linking in with the nhs as well so um yeah it'd be interesting to see that advertising when it comes through thank you thank you councillor madoni councillor kata Hey there, is there a key demographic you're targeting to become foster carers? As um, is that um, just from experience of when I was in the system, and that it's I, I see most foster carers were of the 50 to 60 age range. Uh, that might be wrong. That's it's just what uh, from my um, experience. Uh, so, is your marketing targeted to like audiences that we you'll get more of a response from? So it, it, for example, um, we would want to develop our, at the moment it's a generic marketing brand. Um, so the brand is out there. We've got a marketing strategy to make sure that as many people as possible see it in as many different environments. Um, Facebook is targeting those older age groups, um, kind of the 40 plus. I don't want to offend anybody, but that is there's an age group that uses Facebook that also links into um uh, our fostering recruitment campaign however um there's a cohort that are younger than that who also um look at uh social media so instagram spotify couples who maybe can't have children so we want to target those as well so th that's the social media cohort for for those um people and then there's for example we might have a campaign that's an empty nest campaign for the kind of 50 pluses who may be sending their own children off to university or their own families have moved on. So you want that cohort targeted and there would be a campaign around, you know, um, September time and it's called an empty nest. Um, we won't label it as an empty nest syndrome, but, it, but you might want to think about targeting your your campaigns uh, in order to to attract different age groups but at the moment what we're what we're doing is we just want our brand out there and then we have got those um marketing streams that we're following up and the social media um and then thurrock lakeside anybody who likes going shopping um who may just be interested in inquiring about fostering as well so um i think it, it's very it is very challenging um i think that younger than we are open absolutely open for people who are younger than 30 35 but you're looking at a certain cohort who who've got the space in their homes who want to to do this job um and there is a cohort of experienced um older people who who do have space and who may have that um you know willingness to become a foster care but i wouldn't want to say or prejudice anybody from making an inquiry come and say hello we're very welcoming we'll talk to you about it we'll take you through the process we'll support you we'll do your um give you the information that you need you just need to talk to us so, uh, and we'll we will do what we can to make sure that we can facilitate you becoming a third foster care uh, just to clarify, my my um, point was not about to have any prejudice against who would foster. It's the, you're going to have more success with older people. You say 40 plus, I would have thought it would have been more 50 plus. So I'd have thought it would have been a bit more effective to target that age range instead of more general out there. So that, that was my point. It wasn't that um, we should only be accepting people like that. I just want to clarify that. Thank you, Councillor um, Kata. Um, I would like to move a motion without notice to suspend Council Procedure Rule 11.1 .1 to allow the meeting to continue beyond two and a half hours time limit, maybe for extra 30 minutes, if you don't mind. Any objection? 
No. Okay. Thank you. We can now proceed. Any other questions? Councillor, sorry, Polly. Please, Chair, if you don't mind. Um, my, my question would be uh, towards Sharon and Jenny, if that be allowed, and also to our young chair here, if you don't mind me asking you a question. So we, we've heard that the, um, the Children's Care, uh, Children in Care Council were consulted on branding. Colours on a poster is not what's going to recruit foster families. Are, are any opportunity have you been able to, to meet with other uh, children in other uh, authorities in care to see if they're foster What's the good things about Tharrop? What's uh, what could we do better in other um, authorities? Has there ever been any uh, suggestion you might do that? Sorry, I'm slightly confused to what the question is. Uh, you've been consulted on the branding. The mm. branding, I understand, it is colours on posters. But it, uh, have you? been asked any other questions about what you what you find are good things that are done in Tharrock? Um, yeah, um, we, we, we actually had uh, a meeting last month about the branding and I know that um, me members said that compared to what it was before it was a lot better. Um, but what was also mentioned, although it's it's very colourful, so it's very appealing, it it should also be noted that, you know, being a foster carer isn't all rainbows and like gold. It's yeah, you know, it, it is a massive um, change, and you know, it's not something that's easily and quickly decided on. You know, you, you're not. You, you, have, you also have to think about the children and young people that you're going to get. Um, you know, because they're, they're they're not always going to be all happy go merry. Um, you, you know, you might get really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I know I know that was mentioned, but it was. I mean, I've I've I've, se I've seen the changes to the brand, and it's I, I couldn't believe how quickly it was put in place. To be honest, um, yeah. So. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. That's exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> that was very well said. Thank you. No problem. Sorry, I just wanted to go on. You you said about um, were the children in care council able to speak to other local authorities. Um, we are in, in the process of um, making um, uh, an appointments to go to other children and care council meetings. So Christopher or, or one of the other young people will be actually going to, to sit on, on the panel of, of these children and care councils um, in the Eastern region. So at the moment we're, we're talking with um, uh, Essex and Bedfordshire have offered. Sure. Um, and I should find out tomorrow if there's been something happening with that. So, oh, th that's fantastic because I think Luton did a very similar. Yeah. By the droves, I would think you speak very well. Thank you. Ladies, uh, it, I'm new to the borough. Is Tharrock a good place to be a foster parent? Yes, very. 100%. Um, I've fostered for both Tharrock and Essex um, at the same time when we were a joint authority. Um, and I think that Tharrock is brilliant. The fact that we are a small authority, it means you get to know people, you get quite close relationships. The training in Thurrock is excellent compared to a lot of other training that's been around and the support we get is really good. Um, on the idea of the like the recruitment stuff, um, the 
previous recruitment things, the, uh, the pictures and things in that were very um, sort of across the board, different sort of races, ages, things like that, which was very good and um, we really enjoyed that one. That was, that was our choice actually at the time. There was a, a, a group of carers that got together on that um, and I think that is something that we felt those sort of pictures drew us in. I, uh, I really like the, the, I mean, I think I call it a, like the, the whole spectrum of colours more than the rainbow. It covers sort of everything, which I think is really good. But having the other um, pictures and things to back that up is something I think the joyous carers in to that. Do you feel the same, Jenny? You <laughs> yes, I do, very much so. Um, I joined uh, Thurrock five years ago um, and didn't really think of going anywhere else. I, um, we literally spoke about becoming foster parents and Thurrock was our first choice. It was, it was never, we didn't even look anywhere else. Um, and yeah, it's, it, I thoroughly enjoy it. I feel like I've found what I was meant to do. That's what I honestly feel like. Um, I sort of felt like I went through life. I'd be, I was mum, I'd done all of those bits. And I did the nesting because I started young. Um, and when mine got a bit older, I was like, mm, actually, I don't feel done. Um, and that's how I became a foster parent. But yeah, it's good. The, ascent, the incentives are really good. Um, I mean, the council tax is fantastic. So thank you very, very much, everybody. Getting a zero bill was the best ever. Um, but yeah, no, it's just, it's, it's good. The support's there, the, to, to get to know all of the other carers as well. It's, it is, it's, it's like, a, it's like having a new family. So no, it's lovely. So yeah, I wouldn't change it. Thank you. No, thank you for the feedback because that, that's what we want, isn't it? If we recruit a new foster parents and, and if, if they could meet these two ambassadors, um, I think that's just selling done, isn't it? Thank you very much. Well, <laughs> we're, we're both on recruitment, so they do meet us, so it's okay. We're the ones who stand at Lakeside going, hi, <laughs> come and join us. Thank you, everyone. We are now going to move to recommendations. Are all members in agreement with the recommendations outlined within the report? Thank you. We're now going to item nine. Um, the work program is included at page 6364 of the agenda. Does anyone have anything they wish to add or amend? Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say, I think we had an email through from Wendy um, before the meeting about an independent visitors report that was going to be added to the agenda for September, but I, it's not on there at the moment. So just to flag up that I think that needs to be added to the work programme. I think uh, it's on it for was... January. Hmm? I think it's on for January. All right. The email said it was going to go on... No, it's 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 not. It's not. It's not. It's supposed to be it's for September. We've it agreed that we'll, September. we'll bring something back. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, the one in um, the one you're talking about, Wendy, is the independent reviewing officers' report. But this is for around the independent visitors. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's going to be added on for September. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Um, anything you want to add, amend from the councillors, members? None. Yep. Okay. I suppose obviously we've got a lot of new councillors on corporate parenting. It would be really helpful. Um, if people let us know if there's things that they particularly would like to know more about. Um, obviously, most of you were at the training just before this, this committee. So if there's anything you think I'd really like to know a little bit more about, then we can look at adding that to the programme. 
Sorry, I had one more thing. It's more of a clarification. It's just that um, on this month's uh, work programme, there was children's services performance report. What we actually got was a children's social care performance report. Is is that just a typo? Is that is that just a typo, or was that no, another report that was supposed to come and didn't come? Uh, so, Councillor Muldown, this agenda was published before um, annual council and all the reports that were uh, received, so it just needs to be amended to reflect what the reports actually were in this ag agenda. Yeah, can I just double check, because um, when I was reading the minutes of the last meeting, when I had a look at the agenda for the previous meeting, um, there was something about a children's services performance report being brought but it seems to me that we always have a children's social care performance as a standing agenda item. So was the children's services performance report something additional? No, they were just referring to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And once again, thank you everyone for coming. And that concludes the conclude the business of the meeting this evening. I now declare the meeting closed at 2134. Thank you.